You're listening to Good Mike Work Commentaries, hosted by Greg Morgan, a pro wrestling podcast for adults, discussing the fun, wild, and sometimes insane world of professional wrestling. What is up, everyone? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with episode 490. We are less than three weeks away from WrestleMania 34. We only have two more Monday Night Raws and two more SmackDown Lives until we get to this pay-per-view. And the WrestleMania card is pretty much finalized at this point. There's still maybe one, two, or three matches that need to be officially announced, but the card is, for the most part, set. So this podcast is going to be pretty much all WrestleMania related. We're going to get into this past week's Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live, discuss all of the angles and all of the matches that are currently being set up. And of course, we do have one or two other small announcements to talk about and a couple of things to get into, including just a tiny bit of news on Daniel Bryan. And of course, I have got to open up this podcast with that. Uh, We're going to go a little bit in reverse here. I'm going to talk about SmackDown Live first, and then we'll backtrack and talk about Monday Night Raw. But I don't think I have ever in my entire life been happier for another human being than I am for Daniel Bryan right now. It was uh, announced on Tuesday afternoon on WWE's website and on social media before SmackDown Live went on the air that Daniel Bryan has been completely medically cleared by doctors to return to in-ring action. And wow, what an announcement. Easily the biggest news of the year. Uh, Daniel Bryan, even in a GM role, even being retired for two years, is probably still the most over guy in WWE as far as crowd reaction and how much love he gets from the audience. And this uh, couldn't have come at a better time. Uh, We all speculated that this could be an option months ago. They've been building this issue with Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon for so many months. I was straight up convinced all the way back at Survivor Series that Daniel Bryan was going to get in the ring this year at WrestleMania. But the closer we got, we almost we just stopped hearing about it. The rumors kind of cooled down. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. They were still teasing the issue between Bryan and McMahon, but nothing was really taking place. And then last week on SmackDown, Daniel Bryan wasn't even on the show. And that's when Shane McMahon got the hell beat out of him and got viciously and brutally attacked by Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. And so this week, we knew that Daniel Bryan would probably be on the show to address the whole situation because Shane McMahon apparently was going to be taking a leave of absence in storyline because he was kind of disgusted with his own actions and what he did and interfering in that title match at Fastlane. So before SmackDown goes on the air, they drop this bombshell that Daniel Bryan is cleared to return to the ring. So that was probably a good idea for WWE to announce that, I guess, on social media because it probably really helped ratings for SmackDown. But I think it would have been really fun if uh, Daniel Bryan made that surprise announcement on the show. But either way, it doesn't matter. It is wonderful news, amazing news, glorious news. It's exactly what the WWE needed. I have felt, I think we all have felt, just some sort of a void. It just did not feel right the way Daniel Bryan had to retire. And there's also a lot of speculation on what led to this decision. Daniel Bryan's contract is up in just a few months. I believe it ends in uh, September. And Daniel Bryan has made no secret of the fact that he wants to get back in the ring and he will wrestle again because there are doctors that have cleared him. It's just WWE's doctors that have been apprehensive. So, you know, he said straight up, he said it in interviews, he said it on social media. He does not hide the fact that when his contract is up, he wants to wrestle again. And if WWE isn't going to let him, then he'll just go somewhere else and wrestle. If I had to guess, this just seems to be something that WWE had a feeling that they were going to do at some point. Uh, Maybe they just wanted to keep him out of the ring as long as possible to ensure that he has had a couple of years of rest or they really want to cash in on Daniel Bryan's return by having him return at WrestleMania, because don't forget, WrestleMania 34 is in New Orleans, the same place where he won the uh, world title uh, at WrestleMania 30. So it's the perfect venue, it's the perfect setting, it's the perfect show for this guy to make his in-ring return, and I just my heart is just filled with joy over this. Now, we can speculate as to why this happened or whatever. I've seen cynics already, oh, WWE's just doing this for the money and blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh my God. It just it's it's infuriating. You know, can we at least just be happy about this? Yes, most likely WWE did not want to lose Daniel Bryan in September and have him go somewhere else. I don't think it was a matter of them being worried about other wrestling promotions giving them competition. I think it had more to do with them just not wanting to lose Daniel Bryan. The guy is super over. The WWE audience loves this guy. And they don't want to lose him. So they probably said, look, if there's a way to get him cleared, if we can get enough doctors to say that he's okay, we'll let him get back in the ring. 
And they probably, his contract probably did have a lot to do with them making this decision now because they can't wait forever. If WrestleMania comes and goes, even if they clear Daniel Bryan at this point, he might just want to leave. So for him to come back now, I think ensures that he'll stick around with WWE. And I'm guessing he's going to sign a new contract now. Um, Hopefully he can sign it and have some outs in case, you know, he gets another concussion or WWE doesn't let him wrestle again. He's got a way to get out of it. I don't know the details on this. I don't know if he signed a new contract or if he intends to sign a new contract or what the plan is for Daniel Bryan. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, regardless of what WWE's motivation was or anything like that, Daniel Bryan is back in the ring. And I certainly don't think there's anything too shady going on here. It's not like WWE would put a guy that really shouldn't be wrestling back in the ring and risk his life just for them, you know, not to lose him to another company. I really, truly believe that Daniel Bryan has been cleared by doctors. I don't think it's any shady under-the-table stuff. I think he definitely did go to multiple specialists. It's not in Daniel Bryan's nature to go out there and lie. I don't think anything Daniel Bryan is saying is untrue. I think that he's been visiting specialists ever since he had to retire, and he's had doctors for the past two years telling him that he can wrestle. But it's WWE's guys. It's this Joseph Maroon that seemed to be so apprehensive for so long. And now... You know, maybe WWE said, hey, can we get this guy fucking cleared so we don't lose him, please? And they cleared him, and now he's back. And this is a guy that WWE desperately needs, and I just, I am really rooting for his success here. He's got to have some ring rust, and it might take a while for him to kind of get back into full-on ring shape, even though I'm sure he's been working out, and uh, working out in the ring and training and all of that. You know, he's been out of the ring essentially for two years now. You know, I think he should take it easy, not go too crazy too quickly, not go crazy with the bumps. I mean, he needs to go balls to the wall. If he's going to be back, you know, as an in-ring competitor, he doesn't want to, he can't be that protected. He's got to go out there and put it all on the line, but just be careful. Watch your head. No flying headbutts. Don't take any chair shots or ring post shots or anything like that. Just be fucking careful out there because if Daniel Bryan were to get another concussion, I don't know if they would let him back in the ring again. So I'm really going to keep my fingers crossed that Daniel Bryan's return to the ring is a successful one, that he stays safe, that he stays healthy, and that he can get back into world title contention. And now that he's been gone for two years, the dream matches are like out the ass now. Imagine him and AJ having a match. Imagine Daniel Bryan and Nakamura. And I'm excited as hell for this. And I'm guessing that he's going to be a SmackDown competitor since technically he is the GM of SmackDown. And you got to think that that's going to change, that he's not going to be able to maintain the GM role past WrestleMania. They're going to have to find a new guy. I think he might stay in that role until WrestleMania, but maybe after that they're going to have to announce somebody else. And I'll be happy to listen to candidates for who you guys think might be the new GM of SmackDown. And don't forget, Shane was kind of taking a leave of absence too, so SmackDown might have lost its commissioner and its GM. So I don't know what they're going to do with SmackDown once we get on the other side of WrestleMania. And it opens up some intriguing possibilities, but... You know, Daniel Bryan coming back to the ring is just, it's just amazing news. And as far as what we saw from Daniel Bryan on SmackDown Live, he opened the show. Uh, The crowd popped huge for him. He came out there, the yes chants, the fans. It seemed like they were all literally in tears over this great Daniel Bryan news. And uh, Bryan gets on the mic, cuts a small promo, thanks the fans, thanks the WWE for giving his case a second look. Uh, Gave a lot of props to Bree. Bree was in his ear telling him to fight for what he wants and don't give up and try to get back in the ring. And she stood by him and she supported him. And as much as her yelling out Bree mode makes me throw up, I'm almost willing to forgive her. Thank Thank you so much, Brie Bella, for being an excellent wife to Daniel Bryan and being a supportive spouse. And you really helped him get through this, it sounds like, not only with his retirement, but now his return to the ring. And uh, Bryan had a lot of awesome things to say about Brie, which was nice. And then he talked about when or if he's going to get back in the ring, or when, I should say. And it was really cool when he said, I don't know when I'm going to get back in the ring or where the right stage for me to return to the ring would be. And then all of the fans started pointing to the WrestleMania sign. And I thought that was awesome because it's just so overdone and stupid and lame the way all these wrestlers always point to the fucking WrestleMania sign. It's so damn stupid. And just to see the fans do it while Daniel Bryan looks at the sign, there was something very powerful and moving about that uh, that I really enjoyed. So we know we're going to get some sort of a Daniel Bryan match at WrestleMania. He pretty much said so himself in that promo. We just don't know what. And that was set up later on in the show because Daniel Daniel Bryan was out there to also deal with the repercussions for Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn attacking Shane McMahon last week. At the time, Owens and Zayn weren't in the building, so Daniel Bryan said he will be back later in the night to deal with the two of them. 
So you fast forward to that segment. Daniel Bryan is back out there in the ring with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, and he fires them. He has no choice because they brutally attacked the commissioner on SmackDown last week. He fires them right in the middle of the ring, and you knew it there. I mean, you kind of knew the whole show. It was pretty much a a guarantee there that Daniel Bryan was going to get beat up just like Shane McMahon did the week before because Daniel Bryan's there all by himself. He just got cleared so he can take bumps again. And uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn kicking his ass was something that I expected and I found to be incredibly predictable, but it was still good. Now Daniel Bryan fires the two guys that were supposed to have a one-on-one match at WrestleMania. That's what Shane McMahon announced the week before. I think we can all agree that none of us really expected that one-on-one match to take place. We knew that Shane was going to get involved and possibly even Daniel Bryan. So with Owens and Zayn annihilating Shane last week and then Daniel Bryan firing him this week on SmackDown, that prompts Kevin Owens to nail Daniel Bryan with a punch and then Daniel Bryan gets worked over by Zayn and Owens. Daniel did get a little bit of offense. He was throwing the kicks on uh, on Kevin Owens which was awesome. The yes kicks. The crowd was going nuts for that. Eventually Sammy jumped in there and interrupted those and started beating down Daniel Bryan and, the, and then the two of them uh, just beat the shit out of him. We had super kicks. We had Sammy Zayn's uh, kick finisher in the corner. I don't know if Kevin Owens hit him with the pop-up powerbomb or not but I do know they hit him with the apron powerbomb on the outside side of the ring and even though Daniel Bryan was in there taking an ass kicking I was just I was giddy with excitement just watching this guy take bumps again you know I mean I just love it I just cannot believe that he's in there getting physical it's so great I mean it's just been torture for us as fans to watch this guy in the ring knowing that he can't wrestle again so the fact that he's out there taking an ass kicking like this from these two guys I thought was great and uh, that pretty much sets up now what I'm assuming is going to be a tag team match at WrestleMania. And there's a lot of questions regarding this as well, because both of these tag teams, if you're going to go with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn taking on Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan, that's a match that I'm assuming absolutely has to be announced by next week on SmackDown at the very latest, because the week after that is the go-home show. So I think what's going to wind up happening is that Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon are both going to be pissed off. I mean, severely pissed off that they both got killed by these two guys. And technically, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are fired. But I'm guessing that Daniel Bryan and Shane are going to reverse that decision, rehire them so they can take them on in a tag team match at WrestleMania. Now, on one hand, I think this is a really good idea because we've all been wondering about Daniel Bryan facing Shane McMahon in a one-on-one match ever since they've been having tension dating back to last year. But one of my concerns was is that Daniel Bryan, if he's coming back from an injury like this and he does get cleared and he has concussion problems and things like that, and it's his first match back where he probably has to work off a little bit of ring rust, I don't know if Shane McMahon is the right opponent for Daniel Bryan to be in there with. Because Shane McMahon is not a wrestler. He's an uncoordinated, stumbling, bumbling fuck, just like his dad. He's not quite as bad as his dad. Shane has got some moves, and Shane's Shane's not bad. For a part-time wrestler and somebody of his age, he does some crazy things, and I'm a fan of Shane's, and he can go out there and have good matches, and he can sell his ass off for guys and put guys over, but... With Owens and Zayn, I feel like they are going to protect Daniel Bryan a lot better because those two guys are professionals to the bone. And uh, Daniel Bryan is their boy, and they're going to make sure that he is taken care of and protected at WrestleMania, where if Daniel Bryan was in the ring with Shane McMahon one-on-one, Shane is going to be throwing some Idaho's in there, and he's going to potato the fuck out of Daniel Bryan's head and could injure the guy. So I think just for Daniel Bryan's sake that this is the better match. And I'm not saying Daniel Bryan needs to be babied and and people need to pussyfoot around him and protect him and, and, and go out of their way to, you know, to not hurt him at all. I mean, I think Daniel Bryan needs to get physical in there. He needs to take some serious bumps and all of that. But since he is just coming back and it's his first match back, go easy on the guy. He hasn't taken any insane bumps in a while. So for him to be in there with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, you know that they're going to take care of him. So for Daniel Bryan's health and for the future of his career, maybe a tag team match would be better because he'll also be limited. He'll be only one half of a tag team, so he won't be in there the whole match. You know, Shane can do some of the work. Brian can do some of the work, and it might actually end up better this way for Daniel Bryan. Now, you got to think if they're going to do any sort of an angle here or a swerve at WrestleMania, because we cannot ignore the issues between Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon. So are they going to do something to where Shane turns on Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania? We don't see that usually. I'm trying to think. Do we ever see like major angles like that happen at WrestleMania? Do we ever see any big heel turns? I know we see some, like the Austin heel turn. But in this, if they had Shane McMahon for some reason 
turn heel on Daniel Bryan and align himself with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, that could set up a Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon match at the next pay-per-view or in the future or something like that. I don't know why Shane McMahon would turn heel on Daniel Bryan, especially after he gets his ass kicked by Owens and Zayn. I can't imagine Shane McMahon aligning himself with these guys and then claiming the whole thing was a ruse just to annihilate Daniel Bryan. That doesn't really make any logical sense. And it sure as hell wouldn't make any sense for Daniel Bryan to turn heel either and join up with Owens and Zayn because Daniel Bryan is the most over babyface, arguably, in the last 10 or 15 years in WWE. And uh, he does not need to be turning heel right now. So I don't know if Daniel Bryan and Shane are going to coexist and uh, get along at WrestleMania. And because don't forget, Shane doesn't have a good record at WrestleMania. He's come back the past couple of years, worked with Taker and worked with AJ, and he lost both matches. So this might be a way to give Shane McMahon a victory at WrestleMania and give Daniel Bryan a victory in his first match back. And then you can do all sorts of shit in the next pay-per-view with Daniel Bryan, maybe taking on Kevin Owens one-on-one or Sami Zayn one-on-one, and maybe eventually Shane McMahon, because there's just no way all of this tension and all of this this heat between these two guys is just going to be dropped. I think WWE has had a plan here in mind for a while, and even though Daniel Bryan has only recently been cleared, like I said earlier, you just got to think that WWE had a feeling or knew that this was going to wind up happening. They knew that he was going to get cleared probably right before WrestleMania, which is why they planted a lot of these seeds a couple of months ago. So it's going to be interesting to see what takes place next week on SmackDown Live because you know that's when we're going to get the Daniel Bryan match announced, whether it be a tag team match with Shane against Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn or whether it's just some random one-on-one match. And one match that could potentially be a possibility, and I'm really hoping that it's not, even though the match would be awesome, is uh, Daniel Bryan might have to be a last-minute replacement for AJ Styles if, for any reason, this injury that AJ has suffered keeps him out of his title match with Nakamura at WrestleMania. And maybe they insert Daniel Bryan into his place, because Daniel Bryan and Nakamura would be a pretty fun goddamn match, too. Uh, But I would be heartbroken if they did that. I think keep Daniel Bryan in this GM situation with Shane and Owens and Zayn and then Daniel Bryan can get all the opportunities in the future future title shots and all of that I really hope that AJ is able to make his match with Nakamura he has not been wrestling much on the house shows and on uh, on Smackdown and he was, did commentary this past week so hopefully whatever's going on with his knee I think it's his knee I know he tweaked something uh, whatever it is I hope he's at least able to make it to Wrestlemania he might not be 100% um, but I'm hoping for the absolute best in the AJ style situation but I guess technically maybe Daniel Bryan could be inserted into that situation if AJ can't go Uh, but if he's not you know Daniel Bryan is going to get some title matches in the future I was having a lot of people tweet me and mention in comments oh Daniel Bryan so glad he's back now he can now he can beat Roman Reigns now Roman Reigns can put him over I just laugh my ass off that everybody's first thought is Roman Reigns a guy that has nothing to do with Daniel Bryan no issue with him at all and is on a completely different brand Roman Reigns is the first guy that they want to see Daniel Bryan face because everybody hates Roman so bad they want to see Daniel Bryan beat him and I think everybody just needs to slow down Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns I'm sure will collide again in the future if they ever land on the same brand maybe it's SummerSlam maybe next year at WrestleMania who knows but for the immediate future those are two guys that I don't see crossing paths right now I think if anybody from the Raw brand is going to run into Daniel Bryan first, it's going to be The Miz. Because don't forget about what went on between The Miz and Daniel Bryan a year or so ago on those Talking Smack episodes when The Miz was shooting on him. I mean, I thought back then that Daniel Bryan was going to get cleared because I was like, why do you do this? Why do you have this crazy shoot promo with The Miz and Daniel Bryan and it doesn't lead to Bryan sticking his foot up The Miz's ass? You know, I just don't, I just can't believe it. So that's an issue that needs to be resolved. And I think it's always annoyed a lot of us that Daniel Bryan was ever, was never able to get any retribution. Uh, The Miz did send out a funny little tweet on Tuesday as well, acknowledging that Daniel Bryan is going to be returning to the ring. So if anybody from Raw is going to be facing Daniel Bryan first, it's going to be The Miz. And uh, I think you should move The Miz back over to SmackDown. I think he should drop the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania and move back to SmackDown and uh, have a feud with Daniel Bryan. And eventually, in time, 
And it doesn't have to be long. I'm not saying wait a year or two or anything like that, but I don't think Daniel Bryan returns to the ring and you give him the world title the same fucking day. I think fans really just need to exhibit some patience here and not be so damn crazy and just take a deep breath and slow down. There's no rush. If Daniel Bryan is back full time, he's got all the time in the world to get opportunities. And I think those opportunities should be on SmackDown. Leave Raw to Roman Reigns and Samoa Joe and Braun Strowman and guys like that. SmackDown can have the wrestlers. SmackDown can now have AJ, Nakamura, Daniel Bryan, Owens, Zayn. Maybe you can move Seth Rollins over to SmackDown as well. I mean, think about think about the matches there you could have. So not that Daniel Bryan wouldn't be good on Raw, not that he can't make some appearances on Raw, but I kind of think right now my initial uh, opinion and my initial instinct tells me that SmackDown might be the better place for him. So as you can tell, I'm very, very excited, and uh, my mind is racing just as fast as all of your minds are racing about Daniel Bryan, and I couldn't be happier. I just want to welcome him back. Uh, not a nicer guy you will ever find in the wrestling business, that's for sure. Daniel Bryan is just uh, a good-hearted, humble dude, plaid shirt-wearing, long-haired hippie, and uh, there's just there's nothing not to like about him. So I am thrilled to death for Daniel Bryan and so happy. Welcome back, d I cannot wait to see what you do at WrestleMania. And like I said, we'll get our answers there probably on next week's SmackDown. As far as this past week's SmackDown, some of the other things that we saw, I spoke about AJ Styles a minute ago. He was at ringside to do commentary for another Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rusev match. And Nakamura got the victory there. Aiden English jumped in the ring after the match and started beating up Nakamura with Rusev. AJ was on the outside of the ring and it looked like he was about to get involved and about to make the save, but Nakamura handled the business on his own and uh, AJ just stood out there. So it looks like they're, you know, this match is probably not in jeopardy it's just AJ Styles right now it doesn't seem like is 100% so they're probably just trying to have him rest his injury and be as healthy as possible for his match with Nakamura and I would think knowing AJ that his leg would have to fall off for him to miss this match with Nakamura so my my gut is telling me that this match is going to happen, but I really don't want AJ to go out there at 50%. I'm hoping that he's as healthy as possible, and I certainly hope uh, that he doesn't miss the match. So hoping for the best there. We did get the official announcement as well on the United States title match at WrestleMania. That is going to be mirroring the Intercontinental title on Raw, and we're going to get a triple threat for this belt too. And it is going to be, as predicted, Jinder Mahal versus Randy Orton versus Bobby Roode. There was a promo between the three of them. Jinder Mahal was out there running his match. Mouth. Rude came out. Orton came out. There was a little scuffle with all three. Uh, Rude tried to go for the DDT on Orton, and Orton tried to go for the RKO on Rude. They both countered, had a stare down, and that was the end of that. So I might actually predict gender. I think uh, WWE's got to have some heels win on this pay-per-view and Jinder might be one of them because he looks like he's just humiliated every week. I mean, they're making fun of him. Uh, Randy Orton just straight up told him he sucked (laughs) this past week on SmackDown. So maybe Jinder is due for a victory here. I don't know. But right now I'm thinking maybe he walks out uh, with the U.S. title. We had yet another Money in the Bank cash-in tease by Carmella on this past week's SmackDown as well. Natalia was having a one-on-one match with Charlotte, and as both ladies are down during a pretty good match, I have to say, both those girls uh, put on a pretty decent little SmackDown contest there, and they're both laid out in the ring, and Carmella runs out with a briefcase to cash in yet again, which is like the sixth time they have teased us with this. And uh, the bell never really rang. Charlotte kind of ran her off. And in the confusion, I think Natalia was able to roll up her schoolboy Charlotte for a quick three count there. So Natalia won. Uh, usually I'm not a big fan of champions losing, but this was a match where there was all sorts of interference. It wasn't a big deal. I usually, what, I, what really bothers me is when champions lose clean, when they lose a match to an opponent with a stipulation. If you can beat the champion, then you can be inserted into this or whatever. You know, situations like that is usually when I'm bothered the most most about champions losing right before a pay-per-view, but a situation like this with Charlotte, I don't think it was really that big a deal. And I'm going to tell you one thing right now. I don't know what I'm going to wind up predicting in a couple of weeks when I do my WrestleMania predictions video, but I am not 100% convinced that Asuka's streak is going to continue at WrestleMania. I'm thinking that there's a chance Charlotte ends it. On one hand, you can say, why don't you give that victory to somebody who needs it? Maybe an underneath girl, maybe an NXT call-up, somebody like Ember Moon ending the streak, maybe at SummerSlam might be a better idea. Sure, you might be right. It actually might be a better idea. But, you know, Charlotte beating Asuka at WrestleMania, somebody has got to retain their belts here. 
You know, I mean, we have a lot of titles on the line, and right now it's looking like we're going to get a lot of title changes. So we need to see some people retain, and this could be a situation where the champion retains because over on Raw, I'm almost certain Nia Jax is going to squash Little Biscuit Butt. So on SmackDown, you got to wonder if maybe Charlotte retains somehow. You know, both tag team belts probably can't change hands either. So somebody's got to retain on the SmackDown side of things or on the Raw side of things. So we've got to have a couple of people retain their belts. We can't have title changes across the board here. So in the back of my mind right now, I might have Charlotte penciled in to retain. I don't know if I'll wind up predicting that or not in a couple of weeks. I'll have to wait and see how I feel by the time I get to my predictions video. But right now, I'm not sold on Asuka winning. I'd be fine if she did. I think it's going to be a great match. I think it's one of the matches on the card that makes the card look so good on paper. Because this really is one of the first ever female dream matches. I mean, we haven't had very good female wrestling in the last 20 plus years or so. It's about as good as it's ever been. And these are two ladies that seem like they've been on a collision course for a couple of years now. And we've been waiting to see it. So uh, to me, the jury is out on who wins. And I don't think it's 100% guaranteed uh, that it's going to be Asuka. Uh, the rest of SmackDown was pretty much uneventful. We had Baron Corbin defeating Ty Dillinger in a one-on-one -on -one match. Luke Harper beat Jimmy Uso in a one-on-one -on -one match. And I don't know if the tag team title match has been officially announced yet. I guess that's going to come next week. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be the Usos versus the Bludgeon Brothers or a three-way with New Day. Don't really know. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Mania card here. Yeah, according to my notes, a SmackDown tag team title match has not yet been announced. So I guess we'll probably get that by next week. And we also had another ladies match on SmackDown. We had Becky Lynch and Naomi defeating uh, Liv Morgan and Sarah Logan. So SmackDown wasn't a horrible show this week. Things have gotten better in the past couple of weeks. The beatdown of Shane McMahon last week was pretty good. And of course, everything on SmackDown this week revolved around Daniel Bryan being cleared to return to the ring and that whole segment with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn beating up Daniel Bryan. And all in all, it was a pretty good show. And now uh, WrestleMania is looking really good now that you got Daniel Bryan as a competitor on this card. We also had some news coming out of 205 Live as well. The finals of the Cruiserweight Tournament is now set. We had Mustafa Ali defeating Drew Gulak in the semifinal match to advance to the finals to face Cedric. Cedric Alexander has been my pick right from the beginning here. I feel like they've been building this issue with him for months. He's been the guy that's just been there every week, giving it his all. He's had a couple of opportunities that haven't panned out, and it just seems like he's the guy that really should get this belt. He's the one that deserves it the most. But I got to be honest with you, Mustafa Ali is an incredibly underrated worker, and uh, he's one of the best guys on that roster, and I am so happy that the WWE recognize that because when he first got there and he first came in he was just really under the radar and there's a lot of guys like that so i'm glad that wwe and the fans were able to connect with him he's very well respected his matches are amazing uh he's so fucking athletic so is cedric alexander this is going to be a great match uh it's babyface versus babyface but who cares i think it's going to be awesome most likely as much as i would like to see this on the main wrestlemania card i'm thinking it's going to be on the kickoff but you know i'm not going to let that get to me too much it's all right it's a seven hour show you got like a three hour kickoff big deal if this match has to be on there that's fine but at least include it in the wrestlemania dvd don't fuck these guys over the way you did neville and uh austin aries uh, last year or whatever it was at least put the match on the dvd version so these guys can get paid and get royalties and all that crap and uh my pick right from the start has been cedric and we'll see if I wind up being right there, but I got to be honest with you, regardless of who wins this match, I'm going to be perfectly fine with it because I think both of these guys are more than worthy of being cruiserweight champion. So I'm actually really looking forward to seeing that uh, finals match at WrestleMania. Let's uh, backtrack now and uh, talk about Monday Night Raw. I was up here doing a live stream on Monday Night Raw, my live Raw watch-alongs. I've been doing that for the past couple of weeks. It was a lot of fun. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, this is a week of technical difficulties for me. Uh, during my Raw live stream, I'm about, uh, I'm about 25 minutes into it. And as I'm talking to you all, all you guys and watching the show, it was right after the Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar segment, all of my computers go dark. All three monitors are shut off, both of my computers, even the lights go out. And I thought I had a power outage. But what wound up happening is my cat was laying underneath the desk, which he does all the time. Uh, but he was laying right across the power strip, the surge protector. And I don't know if his paw or something like that hit the button, but he shut off everything right in the middle of the stream. 
So I had to reboot everything and come back up online. And luckily, all this happened during a commercial break. So I was pretty much up by the time the next match uh, came up on Raw anyway. But it was pretty funny that that happened. It's my first real major hiccup during a live stream. And then on Tuesday, it was pretty funny, too, when the Daniel Bryan news broke. I had to be at work in just a couple hours. I didn't really have time to put together a short video and edit it and render it and then upload it to YouTube. But I did have time to come up and talk for like 20 minutes in a live stream. So I just came up. And as I'm talking about the Daniel Bryan situation, I'm about five minutes in and I'm reading the chat and you guys are like, dude, something's wrong with your microphone. And I check it and my microphone, I don't know what the hell happened. I think I might have just plugged it in too fast and then hit stream too quick or something and didn't let the whole thing set up. But my voice sounded really slow and low. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I had to unplug the microphone, plug it back in. It fixes the situation and I finish the commentary. But after that, I'm like, well, shit, now my video is going to have me talking like Andre the Giant for the first six minutes of it. And I didn't want to bother trimming it in YouTube because when you do that and you edit a video in YouTube, it takes like a full day for that edit to process. So I knew if I left it like that, the only thing I was going to see in the comments is like, what's wrong with your voice? So I deleted the video, cut out the uh, the technical difficulties, and then restreamed the video that I had already recorded a second time. So it cost me about 3,000 views to do that, but it was much better uh, than me sounding like an idiot for the first five minutes of the video and everybody being like, dude, what's wrong with you? So it was uh, technical difficulties twice in a row on Monday with my damn cat turning heel and then with uh, my voice being all fucked up on Tuesday. So hopefully this podcast goes off without a hitch here. But um, like I said, Monday Night Raw was a relatively eventful show, I will say. I thought we did uh, see a lot of stuff here and a lot of stuff started taking shape for WrestleMania. And I thought the opening segment was a perfect combination of good and bad. The first part of it sucked and was ridiculous, and then the second part of it was actually pretty good. So we had Kurt Angle open up Monday Night Raw. He's on the microphone, and of course, Roman Reigns was suspended by Vince McMahon last week after confronting Vince at Gorilla Position. So Kurt Angle is out there talking. I don't even know what the hell he's talking about. And Roman Reigns shows up. He appears in the crowd, and he walks through the crowd completely uncontested no security guards are getting in his way he's wearing his roman reigns outfit and the barricade is even open for him to walk right through and there i was like okay strike one it is good that you didn't do music because if roman reigns would have came out there to his music that would have been fucking insane so he didn't come out there to music so that was good but it was so ridiculously unrealistic and i just wish wwe would think a little bit more with these segments. You want to suspend your disbelief. If you really want us to believe that Roman Reigns is quote-unquote suspended, don't have him just, don't roll out the red carpet for the guy and let him get in the ring. Roman Reigns should have came out there in street clothes. He should have hopped over the barricade completely unannounced. He should have ran to the ring or maybe shoved a couple of security guards out of the way. And he should have been wearing jeans and a t-shirt. He can wear a Roman Reigns t-shirt if you want. I don't care if he wears tap out or anything like that. Just put him in street clothes, not his fucking wrestling gear. And I think if you did it that way and you had Roman Reigns just appear, run through the crowd, hop over the barricade, jump in the ring, take the microphone away from Kurt Angle and demand that Brock Lesnar come out and confront him or whatever, then it would make it would just look better than what it did. So Roman Reigns is out there. He's on the microphone. Kurt Angle then calls for security because Roman Reigns technically is trespassing since he's suspended. And uh, regular security guards don't come out. Oh, no, no. We had U.S. Marshals come out. These guys wearing these uniforms that said U.S. Marshals on the back. And then they handcuff Roman Reigns or they arrest him. And they handcuff his hands like in the front. And then he proceeds with his hands handcuffed to beat the shit out of three U.S. Marshals. Which, I don't know, I'm no lawyer, but I would think that that is assault. I would think that you could be in a lot of trouble for that. If you just kick the shit out of three cops, uh, you might be doing some jail time there. I don't know. It seems to me like something like that would be against the law. I might have to read up on that. Uh, But Roman is just attacking the hell out of these guys and beating the shit out of them with his hands handcuffed. And I'm like, oh God, this is hokey. This could have been done so much better. Even if they wanted to have security come out and escort Roman Reigns out, even if they wanted to bring cops out and quote unquote arrest him, fine. But at least make it realistic. This was so stupid. I I was just cringing through the whole thing. But then it got good. Because Brock Lesnar 
who Vince McMahon guaranteed would be on the show this week. Apparently, he wasn't in the building yet. That's what Kurt Angle said, that Brock wasn't there. He would be there later on. So as Roman Reigns is standing there handcuffed in the ring after he kicks the shit out of three U.S. Marshals, Brock Lesnar's music hits. And he proceeds to come out there and annihilate Roman Reigns. Roman is completely helpless. He's in the handcuffs. He can't move. He can't do anything. And Brock just beats the shit out of him. Brock Lesnar got his Braun Strowman on on Monday Night Raw because he was relentless with Roman Reigns. German suplexes and chair shots. My God. Just wearing his ass out with a steel chair. And he tried to walk away from the ring like twice only to come back for more and beat the shit out of Roman Reigns some more. And eventually, when he's done with them, the medics come out there and uh, strap Roman Reigns to a stretcher. You know that can't be good news. Roman Reigns, things don't end well for Roman whenever he's on a stretcher. We know what happened to him last year with Braun Strowman. And when they're finally starting to wheel Roman Reigns away, Brock comes out for like the third or fourth time, tips over the stretcher, and drags it around. So what I liked and disliked about this segment is that I like the fact that it got brutal at the end. I like that this is more personal than it was in 2015. I keep referencing in every episode, I keep talking about that stupid, lame tug of war that they did with the belt back in 2015. At least this time around, they're trying some different stuff. They're trying to make it a personal issue. They had Roman Reigns cut like a work shoot promo on Brock. He got in Paul Heyman's face. Brock Lesnar has been no-showing, disrespecting Roman Reigns. And now Brock comes out there and takes advantage of a helpless Roman Reigns who has got handcuffs on his hands and proceeds just to brutally beat the shit out of him, Braun Strowman style, on Monday Night Raw. So if they just would have tweaked up that segment a little more... Like I said in the beginning, by having Roman come out there in street clothes, uh, maybe hopping over the barricade instead of having the thing laid open for him, you know, and maybe running out there quicker or, you know, not beating up U.S. Marshals or whatever, and then have Brock come out and kick his ass, that would have been better. And then there's one other thing that I thought would have been really nice in this segment, blood. I think Roman Reigns should have bled buckets out there. Because remember back in 2013 when they did a segment kind of like this when Triple H ran out there and attacked Brock Lesnar in like the opening segment of Raw and Brock just got the whole side of his head just completely busted open and it looked awesome. And it was the only good part of that entire Brock Lesnar and Triple H situation. That entire feud was stupid. I hated that Triple H beat Brock at WrestleMania 29. But that segment between the two on Raw leading up to that was very good. So if they just would have added a little bit more realism to this and had Roman bleed a little bit, I think they would have accomplished what they were trying to accomplish. I don't really know if they did that here. But they definitely probably succeeded on getting Roman Reigns a little bit more sympathy. And that's the thing about Roman. I will say this for him. I know a lot of people claim that he can't wrestle. That's ludicrous. For a big guy, Roman Reigns can sell his ass off. He takes some incredible beatings. Every single time Brock Lesnar has ever been in the ring with Roman Reigns, whether it be in a match or a segment, he's owned him. Brock has completely owned Roman Reigns. Same goes for Braun Strowman for the most part. Samoa Joe has uh, beaten up Roman Reigns pretty good as well. So Roman, for a guy that's supposed to be a big bad monster, he does his fair share of selling. He really does. But uh, I was just a little bit on the fence about how I felt about this segment. I thought it was good, but it could have been so much better. So I'm optimistic. I've been saying that every week. I don't think these two guys are going to have a terrible match. Right now, it seems like the ending and the finish of WrestleMania is extremely predictable. It seems like Brock is going to be dropping the belt here. He's been champ for a year. There was that insane stat a couple of weeks ago during the gauntlet match. Seth Rollins wrestled more in one match than Brock Lesnar did the entire year. And that's fucking crazy. So I think it's time for Brock to drop the belt. And I think uh, WWE is trying to do their best here to make the fans want to see Brock drop the belt. And I think the fans do want to see Brock drop the belt. The problem is most of those fans just don't want to see Roman being the guy to do it. But like I say about everything, just try to look at the positives here. There is one positive about Roman Reigns winning the belt from Brock Lesnar. That means he's going to have to lose the belt. And you look at a guy like Braun Strowman, who has just been on an absolute tear, and I think absolutely must. It is essential that this guy becomes world champion in 2018. 
Roman could wind up br- dropping this belt to Braun Strowman. That could happen at SummerSlam. That could happen anywhere. Even if you wanted to bring Daniel Bryan over to Raw. I don't think they will, but if you did, he could end Roman's title run at some point. You could do that at SummerSlam. And I think if that happened, it would probably get pop of the century. Could you imagine if Daniel Bryan locks Roman Reigns in the crossface and he fucking taps out and Daniel Bryan wins the title at a pay-per-view? My God. If that place has a roof, it's going to get blown off. But there's lots you can do in the future with Roman Reigns. I don't think Roman is going to do what Brock did and hold the belt for a year or anything like that. So if Roman Reigns wins the Universal title, okay, no big deal. He hasn't even been champion in two years. I will start looking forward to whoever he's going to drop it to because you know he's going to drop it to someone. And most likely that will happen at SummerSlam. So silver lining, that's all I'm asking. You know, don't have a heart attack, conniption fit, hissy fit, whatever you want to call it over this Roman Reigns situation. There There's a lot of other stuff going on in WWE to distract you. Don't forget, we got Daniel Bryan returning to the ring. We've got AJ Styles versus Nakamura on this same card, okay? If you don't want to see Roman win the title from Brock, you've got 13 other matches you can enjoy. This, I guess, will just be one that you don't. Uh, We have another big WrestleMania match that is just a little bit closer to being announced officially, and that is, of course, John Cena versus The Undertaker. Cena cut another promo on Monday Night Raw. A lot of people thought that we might get The Undertaker on Raw. I was saying right from the start, no. I did not think we were going to get an answer from The Undertaker on this past week's Raw because we already had the big segment with Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. And to me, that was kind of significant enough. And plus, John Cena's promo wasn't even in the main event. So I thought that this is something they can stretch out one more week. So Cena was out there again on the mic talking trash about The Undertaker and eventually winds up calling him a coward outright and then repeats it. Undertaker, you are a coward. And he is begging The Undertaker to get back in the ring. He's been getting very personal in his promos. And then Kane winds up coming out and uh, choke slamming John Cena. And they did announce that we're going to get a match between Kane and John Cena next week on Monday Night Raw. And that is going to have to be where we get the Undertaker's response. And there's been a lot of speculation as to what kind of an Undertaker we're going to get. Are we going to get the dead man or are we going to get the American badass or are we going to get Mark Calloway? Because the way Cena has been talking about Taker, talking about his wife and shit like that, you know, this doesn't warrant a response from the dead man, the Undertaker. This warrants a response from the man, Mark Calloway. And I think he should come out as himself and cut a promo. I talked about this weeks ago. You know, Undertaker coming out and cutting one of his dead man promos is going to sound too weird in this whole angle because John Cena is making it so personal. And The Undertaker, we remember how he was during his American Badass days and how his promos were. You know, he's the type of guy that would say, hey, boy, you talk about my fucking wife. I'm going to murder you in front of all these people. That's The Undertaker that I want to see. And as far as how he answers John Cena's challenge, I don't know. I don't even know if we need to see The Undertaker on Raw. I think it could be a video package thing. I think it could be a Titantron thing. John Cena, after his match with Kane or during his match with Kane, maybe the lights go out and... uh, The American badass appears on the Titan Tron and accepts John Cena's uh, challenge. Or maybe the dead man accepts it, but then we get the badass as a surprise at WrestleMania. I don't know. But I think if it was up to me, the only way to make this interesting is to not have the dead man face John Cena and have the American badass or be or have whoever Mark Calloway really is. That guy come out and face John Cena because this is a situation where we just need to see him act more like a human being. And if we see that right before he retires for good, I think it will help and make his Hall of Fame induction a little bit less, I don't know, weird, because we have no idea what kind of an undertaker we're going to see when he finally does go into the Hall of Fame. He's never even appeared in the Hall of Fame except one time during that small tribute to Paul Bearer, and he's always been in character. He's never been seen or photographed in the crowd or in the audience, and he's never inducted anybody. He's never done anything. So if you have Undertaker come out this year as Mark, cut a couple of promos, and be that American badass type of guy, that'll make things a lot easier next year when he goes into the Hall of Fame at WrestleMania 35. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that this Undertaker and John Cena situation will be good. I've been adamant that I was not a fan, and I was very much against this idea of the Undertaker coming out of retirement. But if they do it in a fun way and they make it good, hell, why not? He's the Undertaker. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to come back once a year, get a big payday and work a shitty match, fine. Who am I to question the dead man? I'm not gonna. 
Let's move on now to the main event of this past week's Monday Night Raw, and that, of course, was the much-anticipated ultimate deletion from the Hardy compound, Matt Hardy versus Bray Wyatt. Matt Hardy kind of challenged Bray Wyatt to this a couple of weeks ago. Apparently, this was filmed last week, and they were advertising it for Monday Night Raw. I thought maybe it was going to be a WrestleMania match, but turns out they did it on Raw. It was the main event, and man, going into it, we were all nervous. We were really hoping that they could do their best here to recreate the magic and the buzz that it had in TNA. And I got to say, WWE came pretty damn close. I put a Twitter poll up right after the Ultimate Deletion. If you guys liked it, yes or no, about 400 votes on that poll. And it was an overwhelming yes, 86% yes, 14% no. Now, the Ultimate Deletion wasn't perfect by any means. Some people even said that it felt rushed and the ending came kind of came out of nowhere. But I thought overall for them recapturing the magic and the Vanguard 1 and the dilapidated boat, and we had Maxwell and Rebbe and Senior Benjamin out there, even a small cameo from Jeff Hardy and everything that we saw. The, I didn't really like the fireworks stuff. Some of that was a little kind of hokey and weird. Uh, But overall, I thought it was a fun, entertaining segment. I thought the music effects were really good. I thought it was well produced. This is Matt's baby. I mean, this is Matt's child. This is his first time to really... I mean, how many times in history has has any of us ever tuned in to Monday Night Raw to see what Matt Hardy was going to do? You know, when has anybody ever said that before? And we all tuned into Raw this week because we wanted to see this ultimate deletion. And I was pretty entertained by it. I mean, this is <laughs> this shit is so goofy. I'm even laugh. I was laughing at myself earlier on in the day, too, when I'm making my notes for this podcast and I'm typing things like Matt instructs Senior Benjamin to retrieve Bray's carcass from the Lake of Reincarnation. And I'm like, what the fuck am I typing here? If anybody comes over and sees these notes up on my computer screen, they're going to be like, Greg is fucking out of his mind. Just the fact that I'm typing these words on a screen was making me laugh out loud. But uh, the whole match and the whole thing I thought was good. It was well done. It was fun. It was entertaining. That's the point. And the ending saw Senior Benjamin uh, hiding under the dilapidated boat. Which I think the dilapidated boat has a name too. I forgot what the dilapidated boat's name is. Scars Guard or some shit. So he flips over the boat only to find Senior Benjamin hiding in there and he's got a globe in his hand. And he throws the globe at Bray Wyatt. He catches it and he starts singing, You've got the whole world in your hands. And then next to Bray, Jeff Hardy appears and sings, You've got the whole world in your hands. And then Matt Hardy nails Bray Wyatt with a twist of fate on the grass, on the lawn, and uh, pins him one, two, three. And then after the pin, because there's a referee out there (laughs) for some reason, after the pin, Matt Hardy chucks Bray Wyatt's body into the lake and then instructs Senior Benjamin to retrieve Bray Wyatt's carcass from the Lake of Reincarnation. And when he went to go get Bray Wyatt, there was nobody there. And then it ends with Matt Hardy saying Bray has been deleted. And I guess that was the point, right? This was the ultimate deletion. And with Bray Wyatt falling into the lake of reincarnation and disappearing, he has truly been deleted. And there has been some rumors that maybe Bray Wyatt is going to get a repackage here. Because don't forget, a couple of months ago, when he was working with Finn Balor, he was supposed to come back as Sister Abigail. But the mumps tore through the locker room and fucked up his match. And they never really paid that off. So now with Bray Wyatt kind of disappearing in this lake and being deleted, you got to wonder when he comes back, if he's going to have a little bit different of a look or maybe even a new gimmick, or maybe he comes back as Sister Abigail. Whatever he does, I think they should do some sort of a repackage on Bray Wyatt because, you know, Bray has been, he's been shit in the past couple of years. So maybe this is a way to keep him off of TV for for a while and bring him back in a couple of weeks, maybe after WrestleMania, which kind of sucks. That means Bray Wyatt is going to miss WrestleMania. I don't know if we're going to get a chance to have Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy do something else at WrestleMania. Maybe Bray Wyatt comes back on the Go Home Show, repackaged to Sister Abigail, and we get a one-on-one match added last minute to WrestleMania between Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt. If not, I don't know what these guys are going to do. Battle Royal, maybe. I mean, what's Matt going to do? Matt Matt might be in a situation like Elias. I mentioned last week that Elias should be involved in a big segment. He doesn't necessarily have to be in a match. Maybe put him out there with The Rock or Chris Jericho and do a sing-along or some shit like that, you know? Maybe Matt Hardy can do something similar where he's just in this really weird, goofy ass promo with maybe a couple of WWE legends or whatever. So I guess uh, we'll find out in the next week or two if Matt Hardy is going to be doing anything at all at WrestleMania and what the future holds for Bray Wyatt and when he comes back, if he's going to look a little bit different. 
But as far as the ultimate deletion goes, it got it gave me pretty much everything I was looking for. I was looking for silliness. I was looking for craziness. I wanted to feel like I was eating mushrooms, and uh, I definitely did. The whole thing was fucking insane, and it was fun. And to me, that's that's all I want out of wrestling at my age and, and the vibe that I give you guys on my podcast. All I'm looking for is fun. I'm not looking to be angry. I'm not looking to bitch and moan. I'm looking to have fun. And this match was definitely fun. Speaking of fun, my boy, Braun Strowman, was in singles action on Monday Night Raw. He beat Cesaro in a one-on-one match. Of course, Braun Strowman won the tag team number one contenders battle royal last week on Raw by himself. So he set the challenge for the tag team titles at WrestleMania, and there was a lot of speculation that WWE and Storyline was probably going to, quote, force Braun Strowman to find a tag team partner, which I am very much against. I think I'm one of the only people out there that really wants to see Braun Strowman win the tag team titles by himself because that would be significant. That would be something that's never been done, and it would give Braun Strowman something memorable to do at WrestleMania. This guy doesn't need a partner, and there's all sorts of speculation now about who his partner can be. Apparently, it's a partner of his choosing. He never did pick it on Monday Night Raw, so I guess we have one more week, or maybe uh, worst-case scenario, go home Raw. He'll finally announce who his partner is going to be. But I'm hoping, since he didn't announce it on Raw, that they somehow do an angle to where he just doesn't doesn't have one. I don't think he needs one. So many people have thrown out Elias's name. Why Elias? They've been feuding. That makes no fucking sense. That's a match that's literally thrown together. Why are you going to do that? It would make no sense. It would make more sense for Strowman to go alone than to be with Elias. There's another name being tossed around, Samoa Joe. Now, don't get me wrong. That would be a completely badass, unstoppable team. But why? Why do this? Why would Samoa Joe come back and team with Braun Strowman? Makes no logical sense. Why would Joe even care to win the tag team titles with Braun Strowman, a guy that he's had some wars with already? It, it just It's a team that, although it's badass as fuck, it doesn't make sense. So I'm kind of hoping, and I'm still kind of holding out hope here, that Braun Strowman doesn't have a tag team partner. And if he does, it's maybe just a jabroni. Maybe he brings back James Ellsworth or Harvey Whippleman or some schmuck just to stand on the apron, stand right there, don't fucking move, don't say a word, don't do anything, I'll handle the rest. And Strowman does all the work, the partner never even tags into the match, and he's just out there to appease WWE. Fine, you're going to make me have a partner, then give me this little 130-pound guy, and uh, he'll be my partner. So it still remains to be seen what Strowman does at WrestleMania, but I think I'm in the minority here. I just really want to see Braun Strowman win these belts by himself. I'm a fangirl of his. You guys know that. And uh, to me, that would be more fun. I just said that. It's what it's all about, right? It's about fun. And to me, it would be more fun to see Strowman win the belts on his own than to have him team up with Samoa Joe and win the belt. Samoa Joe makes no sense. Elias makes no sense. Strowman either needs to win him by himself or win him with a jabroni tag team partner, with an enhancement talent, with a James Ellsworth or a Colin Delaney type of guy in his corner. You know, aside from him winning him by himself, that's the only thing to me that would make sense. Uh, moving on now to the Intercontinental title situation, we had uh, the Balor Club defeating the Miz Taraj in a six man match on Monday Night Raw. And uh, Seth came out there to make the save after the match when the Miz Taraj was beating down Finn Balor. He had a little stare down with Finn, and uh, that was the end of that segment. So these three guys are going to be facing each other for the IC belt in a triple threat match at WrestleMania, as we know, the Miz versus Finn Balor versus Seth Rollins. And I've been speculating about the Demon the last couple of weeks. It doesn't look like there's any plans to do the Demon at WrestleMania. But what I think would be fun is to have the Demon be a surprise. Don't announce the demon. Don't advertise the demon. Just have the demon come out. Because of those three guys, I think The Miz should drop the Intercontinental title and somehow get over on SmackDown or somehow be on the same brand as Daniel Bryan after uh, WrestleMania. So I think The Miz should drop the belt here. Seth Rollins, I'm such a fan of his. I would prefer Seth to be in the world title picture. Hell, you can move Seth over to SmackDown too and have him contend for the world title over there with all of those great wrestlers like AJ and Nakamura, Daniel Bryan, and others. So I don't necessarily need to see Seth Rollins win the Intercontinental title. I do believe it will make him a Grand Slam champion if he does win it, but it's not something that I really, as a fan, need to see. So of all three of those guys, I think Finn Balor might be the better option there. And since the Demon is undefeated in WWE, I know he's lost in NXT, if you have the Demon come out there as a surprise... 
and that awesome WrestleMania entrance. Could you imagine how fucking badass that would be? How does WWE not do this? So I'm kind of hoping that Finn Balor wins the Intercontinental title as the Demon at WrestleMania. Um, aside from that on Monday Night Raw, not a whole lot. We did get the match between Alexa Bliss and Asuka that was advertised last week. Alexa Bliss got herself intentionally counted out in that match. And as she's trying to leave, that's when Nia Jax hits the ring and chases off Alexa Bliss after knocking down Mickey James, who looked pretty good on Monday Night Raw with that wild hair of hers. And uh, Nia Jax chased down Alexa. And then I think later on, there was a segment backstage with Alexa Bliss and Kurt Angle. And that's where Kurt makes the match official at WrestleMania, Alexa Bliss versus Nia Jax, which we knew we were going to get. We also had a pretty lame promo between Bailey and Sasha Banks. They are still not getting along, and they've got BFF issues and shit. And they're out there cutting a stupid promo. They wound up having a tag team match with Absolution, and they lose after some miscommunication. I think Bailey ran into Sasha, or vice versa, and the other one got pinned. And there's been a lot of talk about having these two ladies face each other at WrestleMania, but you might not need to. They're going to have the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal, and I don't know if the card... I don't know if there's any room to put a 15th or 16th match on this thing, so maybe you hold this one-on-one -on -one match off and you just put them in the battle royal or something i don't know uh, but if they're going to do a one-on-one -on -one with bailey and sasha they need to announce that uh by next week same goes with uh, matt hardy and bray wyatt and uh aside from that the only other thing i have written down for raw aside from the big hall of fame announcement which i'll mention here in a minute is that ronda rousey and elias both had off-air segments on monday night raw and there was some talk some people that listened to the podcast were at Monday Night Raw. I got a few pictures tweeted to me, and you guys were telling me that the ultimate deletion was not played on the screen for the fans. Everybody in the arena got something else. I think Elias came out and did a small song or a concert, and then Ronda Rousey came out for an angle with Dana Brooke. Dana Brooke came out while Ronda is in the ring and cut a promo on her. It wasn't very good. Uh, Ronda had a very, very lame-looking block of one of Dana Brooke's slaps and then she took Dana Brooke over uh Rousey was even wearing some really wild eye makeup just not a very good segment I am just kind of nervous for Ronda Rousey I really want her to be good and I think in time she can be good but right now I'm, I'm not too impressed to be honest with you I hate to say that uh because I'm a Rousey fan and of course the final thing I will talk about as far as Monday Night Raw goes is they announced the final 2018 Hall of Fame inductee and it is none other than Mark Henry. This was announced earlier on in the day on Monday on social media, and then they did the big announcement in the video package for Mark on Raw, and I couldn't be happier. I'm so happy for Mark Henry. There's not a more deserving individual in the WWE. I remember when he signed with the company. I remember when he debuted at Mind Games 22 years ago. Uh, so many ups and downs in his career, so many different stages of his career, and uh, the fact that he has been there that long and made that big of a legacy for himself, I did not think that Mark Henry was going to last that long. If you would have told me in 1996 that he would be around for 22 years, I would have told you you were fucking crazy. So Mark Henry is just a stand-up guy. He's awesome. Uh, big legacy in WWE. Very successful African-American wrestler for that company as well. Multiple-time world champion. He's uh, had some very memorable moments because his career has spanned multiple eras. You know, even when he came in in the mid-90s there and then all the way through the Attitude Era with the sexual chocolate and the affair with Mae Young and having a hand for a son and him trying to date China and all the crazy shit that he did and then evolving into the Hall of Pain Mark Henry where he had some world title runs. He was a dangerous heel for a while there. The great tease of the retirement speech that he had a couple of years ago when he attacked John Cena. That was really well done. He's just an awesome guy, and I cannot be happier for Mark Henry. And it looked like a lot of fans were giving Mark Henry a lot of love as well, which was good to see because since this was our final inductee for this year, I was worried that fans were going to be like, well, what about so-and-so? Or what about this guy? Or what about that guy? And fuck Mark Henry. Or, you know, you know how fans can be. They can just be jack-offs. But we didn't really get that. Everybody was totally cool. Everybody was totally respectful of Mark Henry. And I appreciate the fans showing him love and not getting too bent out of shape. Uh, that maybe this Hall of Fame class in 2018 is a little bit weak. I will admit that. I mean, Goldberg is a pretty solid headliner. I mean, he's a bigger headliner than maybe a Ted DiBiase or a Kevin Nash in, in recent years. But overall, the class is just, I don't know, so-so. I think it's going to be interesting to see Jeff Jarrett go into the Hall of Fame. I'm going to really enjoy watching the Dudleys go into the Hall of Fame because I even saw uh, Bubba Ray Dudley asked Edge 
on his podcast or on some podcast this week if uh, Edge and Christian would do the honors and induct the Dudleys into the Hall of Fame. And Edge was like, fuck yeah, of course we'll do it. So that's going to be fun. And it would be really cool. They both mentioned this is that sometime during the induction of the Dudley boys, if they got the Hardy boys up there as well, because all six guys have not been in the same company in a long time. They haven't been in the same place together in 15 years or more. So to get all of them up there on stage together, I think it's going to be a pretty special moment for the Hall of Fame. So I think even though it's not the strongest class that we've seen, the Hall of Fame can still be a lot of fun. And congratulations again to Mark Henry. Uh, You are the fucking man. So that brings us to the WrestleMania card. Here's what we have. Here's what I've got written down. Looks like 14 matches right now. Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar, AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura, the Intercontinental title triple threat between The Miz, Finn Balor, and Seth Rollins, the U.S. title triple threat between Jinder Mahal, Bobby Roode, and Randy Orton, Charlotte versus Asuka for the SmackDown title, Nia versus Alexa for the Raw title, the Cruiserweight tournament final to crown the new Cruiserweight champion, John Cena versus The Undertaker, the Raw mixed tag with Kurt Angle, Rousey, Stephanie, and Triple H, Most likely a SmackDown tag with Daniel Bryan teaming up with Shane to take on Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, although that's still to be finalized. Uh, We also have Braun Strowman taking on The Bar and a partner of his choosing. And the SmackDown tag team titles are going to be defended as well. We just don't know exactly what the match there is yet either. And then we have the Andre the Giant Battle Royal and we have the Women's Battle Royal. So that is 3, 6, 9, 12, 14 matches right there I have written down. They could shoehorn in Sasha Banks and Bailey, maybe even Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy, maybe something with Elias. I don't know. Uh, but most likely aside from maybe one more match, we're looking at a 14 or 15 match card here. And I guess next week we'll probably get the official announcement on Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon and whatever they're doing. We'll probably also get the announcement on the SmackDown tag team title match. And whatever match we're missing, John Cena versus The Undertaker, I suppose, will probably be finalized next week as well. So Mania is not looking bad. I think everybody should be optimistic here. This is a good-looking card on paper. All we got to do is hope that the card translates, uh, you know, to the long seven-hour show that we're all going to have to sit through and endure. But right now, I am excited for WrestleMania. And I don't think I'm in the minority on that. I think a lot of people think that this show can be good, but of course... Uh, This show has its critics out there as well. So only time will tell. I think it's going to be good. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll know whether or not I'm right. And uh, before I get out of here, there is one final piece of news I want to mention because I don't think I brought it up in my last commentary. And that, of course, is WrestleMania 35 is going back to MetLife Stadium in New York. It was officially announced a couple of days ago. They did a big press conference and everything. And I just can't remember in episode 489 if I brought this up. I don't think that I did. I may have. I actually don't remember. But in the off chance I didn't, I figured I'd talk about it here. Um, I'm not a big fan of the cold weather cities. It makes me incredibly nervous going to New York. I understand WWE has to go to New York. They have to. It's too big of a market not to go there. But that damn city doesn't have any indoor stadiums. So you're just playing with fire there. In 2013, they got lucky. I think there was a little bit of rain earlier on in the day. But for the most part, it wasn't too cold. They had the ring heated and the heated ring posts and all of that. And they managed. And it turned out to be fine. But I just hope it doesn't pour down rain or fucking snow or some shit like that. It's a real shame that some of these big market cold weather cities don't have indoor stadiums. But, you know, you just got to go to New York. You have no choice. So WrestleMania 35 will be back at MetLife. Whether or not they eventually go to Chicago and do Soldier Field one year, I don't know. Uh, But aside from New York or maybe a Chicago, uh, I think you got to keep it indoors or you have to keep it on the West Coast or in Florida or somewhere like that. Otherwise, you're just playing with fire with the rain and the weather, and uh, I'm nervous already for next year's WrestleMania 35. And it also brings up a really interesting question about SummerSlam, because SummerSlam has been in New York the past few years at the Barclays Center. It was in L.A. previously for like five or six years prior to that. So there's a lot of speculation now that SummerSlam might have to be moved. And uh, there's been some talk about where it will go if it comes back to Southern California and goes back to L.A. Great. Or it can go to a bigger stadium because I think the Royal Rumble is going to be going to a big uh, baseball stadium next year or something like that. And there's been some some speculation that SummerSlam could do the same. And I got to shout out Solomonster because I was checking out TV Tracks' channel uh, earlier on today. And I saw that he posted a clip of Solomonster pitching the idea of Petco Park right here in San Diego where I live. And I think that would be a marvelous venue. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I bought my tickets for opening day. Uh, for the Padres uh, next week on 
Thursday, I'm going to be going with like 10 of my buddies and we're going to go watch uh, the baseball season kick off. And Petco Park is a beautiful park. It's not that old. It's right in the downtown area. The weather here in San Diego is fucking perfect year round. It would be great in August for SummerSlam. It would just be such a beautiful summer night. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to Petco and just watched a baseball game and just sat and enjoyed the warm, fresh air, looking at the beautiful sunset, you know, and everything that you get out here. It would be a perfect place for SummerSlam. So if SummerSlam winds up here in San Diego at Petco Park, I'll be there. I'll do a big meet and greet somewhere. I live in this town. I know uh, all the spots in San Diego. I think it would be so much fun if they brought SummerSlam down here to San Diego instead of going back to L.A. So just something to think about. But WrestleMania 35 being in New York is kind of scaring the shit out of me. So Anyway, that is it for me. I got to get out of here. I'm recording this actually earlier on in the afternoon, and I'm not going to be able to edit it and upload it to you until I get home from work late tonight. So this is going to be an early Thursday morning commentary for you guys. So I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week. I will be up here on Monday night, most likely for a live raw watch along. And then I'll be up at regular time for my podcast next week. And then after that, it's WrestleMania week with a ton of shit planned, Q&As and live streams and prediction videos and all sorts of stuff going on in just a couple of weeks. So WrestleMania is right around the corner. You guys take care and I will talk to you very soon. Until next time, peace. This has been a Good Mike Work Commentaries production. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash goodmikework. Follow Greg Morgan on Twitter at goodmikework. And visit goodmikeworkcommentaries.com for all the latest podcast and video content.